What I'm about to tell you is one of the strangest stories I have ever come across in science. One that combines this weird looking African frog, human pee, and one of the most destructive pathogens ever discovered by science. It's a story about a true feat of scientific achievement and a story about unintended, devastating consequences. The story begins in the 1920s in South Africa, with a scientist named Lancelot Hogben and a dumb looking, tongueless frog, the African clawed frog. Frog. The African clawed frog is a species native to sub-Saharan Africa. It lives in slow-moving freshwater ponds or swamps and can survive harsh, dry seasons by burrowing into the mud and going dormant. It has a flattened oval body with smooth, slippery skin and no distinct neck. It has no teeth and no tongue, so the frog sucks in food like a vacuum. Their eyes sit unblinking high on the head, which for some reason makes them look as though they have no thoughts in there whatsoever. They don't have eyelids, but instead have a transparent covering. They breathe with their lungs, but also absorb oxygen through their skin, so they can be submerged for very long periods. Wild African clawed frogs are usually mottled olive green to brownish gray on their backs with darker marbling, and paler cream or white underneath. But their skin pigments can change slightly depending on their conditions. When they're placed in a dark environment, they become darker. When placed in a light environment, their skin becomes lighter. This happens over the course of a few hours. It is this little trick that got the scientist Hogbin so interested in them. Hogbin wasn't exactly a frog enthusiast, but rather he was interested in hormones and developmental biology, and he was looking for a model organism for further hormone studies. He suspected that the frog's color change was controlled by their pituitary gland. To test this theory, he removed the gland from several specimens, and pretty much instantly, this proved his theory correct. Once the gland was gone, the frogs turned white no matter what color their environment was. This is because the pituitary gland secretes what is called a melanocyte-stimulating hormone that causes the melanophores to spread their pigment and darken the skin. When it's gone, the frogs turn pale. And when this happens, the frog has become a hormonal blank slate, in a sense. Exactly what's needed in a model organism for controlled experiments. Once the frog no longer made its own pituitary hormones, the scientists could test what happened when they supplied a known dose of pituitary material from a different source. Like from a cow, or more specifically, from an ox. Some of Hogbin's students injected ox pituitary gland extract into the frog's dorsal lymph sac, and they discovered something that would change the world forever. Just a drop of ox pituitary material caused female frogs to eject hundreds of unfertilized eggs into the water within a few hours. Clawed frogs normally never release eggs without male frogs nearby. Okay, that's weird and a little gross and definitely interesting, but why is it such a big deal? It's because of another substance that contains similar hormones, pregnant women's pee. The researchers quickly realized that if they put women's pee into this frog, it could test whether or not the women were pregnant based on whether the frogs released their stash of ova. The reason this works is because of the hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG, which you might have heard about before. It's present in a woman's pee only when she's pregnant. HCG wasn't a new concept to these researchers. It had already been discovered in the 1920s, and scientists at that time used this hormone to develop other pregnancy tests in other animals, like the mouse test and the rabbit test. They would inject a woman's urine into an immature female mouse or rabbit, then dissect the animal a few days later. If the urine came from a pregnant woman, the animal's ovaries would be enlarged. But this was both problematic and time-consuming. For these tests to work, a woman's urine had to be injected twice a day for three days into the mice or rabbits. Then the rabbit would have to be killed, and scientists would examine it, which was sometimes inconclusive. But this frog test changed the entire putting human pee inside of animals game. It required just one injection, and the results could be seen in less than a day. The results were less objective, and the frogs didn't have to be killed, which is of course more humane, and meant that they could be used again and again. Plus, the frogs were easier and cheaper to maintain than rodents. 
In 1938, the Xenopus pregnancy test was published, and it was around 98% accurate. And so, in that one moment, frog futures skyrocketed, and the species rapidly became a global laboratory commodity. Beginning in the late 1930s, South African suppliers collected huge numbers of wild frogs and shipped them abroad to research institutions and diagnostic laboratories. From London to New York, and eventually South America, the Middle East, Asia, and Australia. By the 1950s, Xenopus was one of the most widely kept laboratory amphibians in the world. The pregnancy tests empowered women with better information and were the beginning of an era of better reproductive health care. But their usefulness was soon obsolete. By the 1960s, the pee on a stick test was invented. It uses the same concept as the frog test, but without the frog. The strip contains antibodies that bind to the same HCG hormone, and if present, these antibodies form visible colored lines in the test and control regions as the urine moves up the strip. So the frogs were no longer needed for pregnancy tests. Laboratories were actually struggling to get rid of them. But overall, moving away from the frog test was great for the frogs, great for humanity, great stuff all around. Except for one thing. There was something sinister hiding alongside the African clawed frogs that scientists didn't account for when they shipped them around the world. Something that we didn't even realize was there until 1998. The first signs of it appeared in Australia, in the upland rainforests near Brisbane in the late 1970s. While doing amphibian population surveys, scientists came across something shocking. Streams full of hundreds of dead southern day frogs and southern gastric brooding frogs. Gastric brooding frogs were amazing because they were the only known frogs that incubated the pre-juvenile stages of their offspring and the stomach of the mother. Frogs decompose quickly, so it's rare to see a dead frog. And if there's more than one, that usually means something is very wrong. Uncertain of what was causing this, the researchers continued to monitor their numbers until 1981, when the frogs disappeared entirely. Soon, in southeastern Queensland, several other species started to dramatically decline, dropping by over 90%. In the mid-1980s, more sharp declines struck frogs in the Yungala rainforests, wiping out the northern gastric brooding frog and nearly eliminating the Yungala day frog. By the late 1980s, far northern Queensland rainforests saw widespread losses of at least seven species. Four vanished entirely from the wild, while three survived only in lowland habitats. At least 14 frog species in this area of Australia have been affected, with either total extinction or dramatic losses. The die-off seemed to roll northward like a wave. The pace was shocking spreading at roughly 100 kilometers per year, and the crashes often happened within just a few months. This pattern seemed to be consistent with the spread of a highly infectious disease. A 1994 study began to investigate this possibility. Scientists collected frogs from the area and kept them in two separate tanks, one filled with rainwater and one filled with water from the streams. Those living in rainwater lived for a long time. Those living in the stream-fed tanks died quickly. The pathogen was spreading through the stream water. But scientists were still not sure what the pathogen was, and why it was devastating this local population of frogs. Then, in 1996, herpetologists in Panama, an entire world away, noticed something shocking. Streams full of dead and dying frogs in the upland rainforest. And just like in Australia, there were many species affected and no evidence of environmental causes. Could this be the same pathogen? The scientists in Panama and Australia sent their dead frogs off to be studied together. Of the many possibilities, researchers believed a fungal infection could be the culprit. So they did skin scrapings and microscopy to look for possible fungal structures in the frog's skin. And indeed, they found fungal reproductive structures in the skin of the dead or dying frogs' fingers and backs. They also scraped some off to see if it would reinfect and kill new frogs. It did. They identified this skin disease as cutaneous chytridiomycosis. In 1999, the fungus itself would be identified as Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis, or BD. BD is an aquatic fungus. I genuinely didn't even know that that was a thing. These are rarer than terrestrial fungi, and most of the aquatic fungi that do exist feed on algae or decaying matter, not living vertebrates. But BD is obligately parasitic on amphibian skin, 
this is the only place where it can complete its life cycle. It produces motile zoospores that swim in the water using a single flagellum to search for an amphibian host. Once a zoospore contacts the skin of a susceptible amphibian, it insists and develops into a sporangium within the epidermal layers. The sporangium grows, matures, and produces new zoospores internally. When fully developed, these zoospores are released onto the skin surface and into the surrounding environment, ready to infect new hosts. In this microscope image, you can see the zoospores about to burst out. And BD on the skin of frogs is devastating for them. It affects both their respiration and ability to balance water levels. As the infection worsens, the frog's skin thickens and peels, disrupting water, electrolyte, and oxygen exchange, quickly weakening and often killing the animal. BD grows best in cool, wet environments and is sensitive to high heat and desiccation. This is why scientists kept finding it in the upland rainforests, where temperatures are cooler and things don't tend to dry out. As scientists searched for the vector, the disease spread worldwide, across the Americas, Europe, Asia, and beyond, causing massive declines in over 700 amphibian species and at least 90 extinctions. BD is one of the most lethal pathogens known, spreading easily through water and through contact, even without a host. It infects hundreds of amphibian species, including salamanders some symptomless carriers. While the fungus isn't a zombie fungus, I can't help but think of the fungal infection from The Last of Us, growing from their skin, spreading aggressively all over the world. Except it's worse than that. Imagine if a disease like this infected nearly every mammal. Every human, dog, cat, mouse, cow, monkey, bat. For these amphibian species, it is the apocalypse. When I was a field research assistant in Indonesia in college, my job was to walk up streams at night catching as many frogs as I could to help with population surveys. I knew about this devastating fungus. I knew it was obliterating frog populations the world over. I didn't know where the fungus originated. I didn't know until I started researching this video. And scientists didn't know for a long time either. But by now, you've probably put the pieces together. In 2004, scientists started to as well. They wanted to find out the origin of BD once and for all. So they began testing museum specimens of frogs from before, during, and after the global spread of BD to pinpoint where and when its spread really began. And what they found was that BD started to proliferate in the 1930s. It originated in Africa and it was found to be prevalent on the African clawed frog. The African clawed frog likely acted as the primary vector, carrying BD from Africa to other continents. It went unnoticed for so long because the African clawed frog itself is essentially immune to this fungus. Because BD is thought to have originated in Africa, the African clawed frog evolved alongside it over millennia, developing natural tolerance. It mounts a more effective immune response and produces antimicrobial peptides in its skin that inhibit fungal growth, but the fungus can still be harbored on its skin. So when any African clawed frogs escaped or were intentionally released into the wild from labs all over the world, they brought with them one of the most pathogenic fungi the world has ever seen. The road to hell is indeed paved with good intentions. Hogbin, the scientist who invented this frog pregnancy test, believed science should serve society, not just elite interests. He was committed to practical applications of biology and improving public health and medical diagnostics. He wanted better reproductive health care for women. He wanted a better world. There are many ecological disasters where it's easy to point at the moral failure of the people involved, but this was just a genuine, giant accident. One that for some species, the consequences are irreversible. Now that we understand what this fungal infection is, scientists are working tirelessly to try to reverse its spread, though the work necessary is immense. Unfortunately, BD is probably not going anywhere, and once it spreads to a new environment, it pretty much becomes a permanent part of that ecosystem. So scientists have some creative ideas for frogs to live alongside it. One approach is direct treatment for infected amphibians, like with antifungal medications. A study in 2022 examined whether antifungal and probiotic treatments could help endangered mountain yellow-legged frogs survive outbreaks of BD. 
Antifungal baths did temporarily reduce infections and improve short-term survival, but effects faded within a year and populations still declined. To make this work for real, humans would need to constantly treat every frog population in the world. Not exactly feasible long term. Another idea is one I particularly love. One that uses host defenses and pathogen vulnerabilities to its advantage. In 2024, scientists deployed frog saunas that attracted endangered frogs and enabled body temperatures high enough to clear infections. These saunas were like small artificial greenhouses, which heated up in the sun. The researchers found that sick frogs seemed to spend four times as much time inside the greenhouses than they would by chance, and their infections cleared up at a much higher rate than the control group. It will be challenging to deploy enough greenhouses the world over to make a difference but the materials are cheap and it does seem to work. And perhaps most significantly, scientists are also studying natural genetic resistance in frog populations that have survived BD outbreaks. By identifying genes, immune responses, or skin microbiome characteristics linked to BD resistance, researchers hope to uncover mechanisms of natural adaptation to the pathogen. These insights could then inform conservation efforts, such as selective breeding or reintroduction programs that use resistant individuals to rebuild populations. These combined efforts do offer a glimmer of hope. In the past, scientific advancement for the sake of humanity has inadvertently led to some devastating outcomes for the environment. But science is also the only way forward. Humans create problems, but they also solve them. And right now, the frogs of the world need our unwavering dedication to solving this one. And solving the chytrid crisis won't just involve trekking through rivers deep within rainforests. It will rely on problem solving at every level. Biologists modeling disease spread, chemists designing antifungal compounds, data scientists tracking populations in real time. It's a reminder that saving species doesn't just take compassion, it takes scientific understanding. And that is why I use Brilliant a learning platform built around that same spirit of problem solving. Brilliant helps you think the way scientists do, through interactive lessons that make you see the connections between biology, math, and ecology. If you want to understand how complex problems like this one are solved, Brilliant is a great place to start. Brilliant's data courses, like the Exploring Data Visually or Regression and Classification courses, are a perfect way to start or continue learning data analysis, covering everything from basic like data visualizations to advanced topics like algorithms and regression models. You'll get to experiment with the same kinds of tools used in real-world conservation, spotting patterns, testing hypotheses, and uncovering the hidden relationships behind complex systems. If you want to see how data and problem solving can help save the planet's most vulnerable species, Brilliant is a great place to start. Brilliant helps build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also be becoming a better thinker. And all of this can help you lead the charge in tackling the kinds of complex, interconnected challenges our world is facing, whether that's conserving endangered species, modeling disease outbreaks, or simply learning to see the systems that shape our planet with clearer eyes. So to learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash real science, scan the QR code on screen, or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.